No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f***! What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f***! Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. And welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network. I am your host, Brian Keene. Joining me, the one and only Dungeon Master, 77.1. Hello, everybody. Dungeon Master is off school today because we have snow outside, and that is uh, what we want to tell you here right up front at the beginning of the show. Uh, we had 10,000 downloads for the month of January, actually over 10,000 downloads, and we appreciate that. We're glad that so many people are enjoying the show. We anticipated to have about twice that amount for this week's show uh, because, of course, everybody was expecting us to talk about the current ongoing controversy uh, that has engulfed the Bizarro genre, uh, namely Bizarro Con and changes at Deadite Press, uh, allegations and more. Uh, we do intend to cover that. We had intend to cover it today, uh, but as I said, there's snow outside. Dungeon Master, are you home from school? Um, yep. Yeah, you can verify for the people. You have no school today. Uh, obviously, it would. if you know anything about the controversy, you'll understand my next statement. If you don't know about the controversy... Take my word for it, and you'll find out next week. Um, it would not have been something appropriate to discuss in front of Dungeon Master. Uh, so that's reason number one why we're tabling that until next week. Reason number two is because there's snow and ice on the ground. That's why school is canceled. That's why your Cub Scouts are canceled tonight. And uh, Almost Boy Scouts. Almost Boy Scouts, that's right. It's a very important distinction, almost Boy Scouts. Um, you know, you... Readers or listeners need to keep in mind, Dave drives all the way up here from Baltimore every week. So uh, it would have been a harrowing drive for him. Also, uh, we have uh, author John Quick. He was in town, come all the way up from Tennessee. Uh, he was here on other business, but he was going to stop in and we were going to have him back on the show. Uh, unfortunately, you know, road conditions being what they were, uh, command decision was made. He couldn't make it either. So what we're going to do instead here in a moment, we're going to do a best of, and we're going to play John's first appearance on this show uh, from back in 2017 when he had just released his first novel. He's been very busy since then uh, with uh, several books up on Amazon now and two more about to drop from two different publishers uh, early this year. Uh, in fact, I think the first one comes out from Bloodshot Books in March. So uh, we'll get to that in a moment, but... Anyway, that's what's going on. Uh, no, we're not avoiding talking about the news story, but we will be talking about it next week. Uh, bonus, Mary will be back in studio with us next week, I think. So you'll, you'll get to hear her take on it as well as Matt's and Dave's and my own. Um, so before we get to John Quick's interview, we just want to remind folks, Matt's new short story collection, Edge of Twilight by Matt Wildeson on sale right now in paperback see it it's it's probably very good it's probably very good yeah i don't know if you're old enough to read it or not we'll have to ask matt when he's back on the show and of course mary's new novel behind the door up for pre-order right now from kensington in paperback and ebook my new novel hole in the world up for pre-order right now in paperback and ebook that comes out in late february dungeon master should we plug your new detective agency I'm sure. Yeah, Dungeon Master has a new detective agency. Anybody that has my phone number uh, can 
can hire him. Um, that's what it says on his business card. He used my phone number. And uh, you're, you're solving crimes for free, correct? Helping people and, and solving crimes, all free. Yep. Now, how do, you, how do you expect to afford groceries and an apartment on your own and all that? I'll get um, two jobs. Two jobs. So not only will you be a, a private investigator, you'll have a second job. Yes. Is that going to be a writer or a filmmaker? Maybe both. Well, you better get three jobs then, because you ain't going to make any money off of those either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, you can watch Dave stream most nights on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Meteor Notes. In fact, I bet he'll be streaming tonight since he is snowed in. So anyway, uh, let's get in the Wayback Machine. Uh, this was the first time... Mary interviewed a guest solo, uh, and that guest was, of course, John Quick, as I mentioned. And uh, just apologies again to John for for not being able to get him on this week as we had planned. And apologies to everyone uh, in the industry from the extreme horror and bizarro circles who were expecting our, our very thorough, very balanced coverage. Uh, we will have that for you next week as well. So, here we go. Hello, we're uh, at the horror show with Brian Keane, except that we're not with Brian Keane uh, because he's off doing important businessy stuff for Scares the Care, the weekend charity that raises money for families in need. And But we are here with Dave Thomas, who I believe I'm here. Yes, Brian I'm... calls Mr. Sunshine himself. Yes, that's me. It's, <laughs> it's, it's well before noon, so I'm displeased. <laughs> this is going to be fun because this is my first, I get, first time I ever get to interview a guest, so I'm super excited. And we're working on very little sleep. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be it. Just a oh, rip yeah. roaring good time. It's day three of the convention. If you go to conventions, you know what day three is like. Right? Yes. That's all we need to yes. Start. This is day three of the convention, <laughs> and we are going to rock this. Yeah. Early day three of it. Early <laughs> day three. So we are here with author John Quick. Hello. He, he is the author of the novel Consequences, mm-hmm. and the we were trying to figure out what to call it, a novelette, because that sounds fancy, although I'm not sure we quite have the word yeah, count for that, that. It's, um, it's... the journal of Jeremy Todd, and a short story collection Three shots and a chaser. So yes. the first question I have for you is, how did you get into writing? What made you decide that this crazy endeavor was what you wanted to do? <laughs> I, you know, I'm not sure exactly when the moment was. You know, I've, I've looked back on it now, and especially being here this weekend with all the, you know, I mean, Skip and Spectre. I mean, that was one of the first, you know, moving from Stephen King, Clive Barker, and that kind of thing right. into the, the the different branches out mm-hmm. there. And so getting to see Skip and talk to him and, and things like that. I think it was, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a rock star, you know, like, like, like of kids course. do. <laughs> and here, you know, I even pick up a guitar. I learned to play enough to amuse myself. And, mm-hmm. and you know, my wife, thankfully, didn't <coughs> kill me for... Oh, Bless you. That's <laughs> Sorry. Thankfully, my wife doesn't kill me for amusing myself with it. So <laughs> uh, that's always a plus. Yeah, but uh, you know, I, I see their pictures in Fango, you know, Fangoria magazine and stuff, and they've got the leather jackets and they've got the sunglasses. I'm like, oh man, they yeah. look like rock stars. But <laughs> you can do both. But they're <laughs> writers, okay. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that was where the first nugget. And of course, like a lot of people my generation, it's like I sat down and read Stephen King's on writing. Of course, the first half's great. It's a little mini autobiography. And the second half, it's like, oh, you gave me permission. Okay. So I started playing with it and playing with it. Um, Back in 2005, I was working at a bookstore. And I was like, well, let me me try this. So I tinkered around with it. But I guess just the timing wasn't right. And then now... Several years later, the timing seems to have clicked. So. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, so the the novel mm-hmm. consequences yes. uh, is essentially a maniac story, right? It's, it's a slasher story. It is. What um, would you say are the influences of that? I mean, is it like is it sort of an homage to '80s slashers, or it is? What's your take on it? It, it is, and it isn't. Um, when I was working at the bookstore, I, I discovered that was where I first discovered all the leisure authors, and okay. and uh, one of them was Brian Smith. And I was reading this stuff, and I'm like, "Oh, this guy lives here in Tennessee. That's cool. Let me pick this book up." And I'm reading. Uh, I was reading the Dark Ones, and it was. Uh, I, I'm going. Th- all these locations are familiar. Well, this is back before, you know, the internet got totally 
insane. So I was able to message him directly on Facebook and say, hey, was this said in, in you know, Smyrna? Uh-huh. He said, he messaged back and said, yeah, I grew up on this street in this area. I'm like, no kidding. Okay, <laughs> that's really cool. And I remembered when I was in high school, there was a local legend that ran around. Uh, kind of how consequences starts that it was supposed to be back in the 50s. This guy went nuts, slaughtered his family, hung him upside down from trees, skinned him alive, that kind of thing. Wow. And his ghost was supposed to still haunt this area. And so I asked him if he'd heard that, if it influenced it in any way. He goes, no, that must have been after my time, before my time, something. I was like, okay, cool. And in the back of my head, it was like, oh, that story's still there. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I was a big fan. I grew up on the, the 80s slasher movies. I grew up yep. with Friday the 13th and Halloween and Maniac and all this stuff back then. And I was turning 40, and I sat down and went, you know, if I'm going to do this, this is the time I'm going to do this. And that was the story that came to mind. It, it, it right. had just been sitting there, and I, I made the conscious decision when I sat down to write it, this is going to be an 80s slasher movie. But I'm going to tell it in such a way as I'm not yelling at the screen anymore. Nice. <laughs> nice. So. I like that. <laughs> Thank God for that. Because <laughs> we have all done that. Uh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, it, so it, a couple of things that your, your answer, a couple of questions your answer mm-hmm. raises. One thing you said, you said you're from Tennessee. Yes. Right? Middle Tennessee, I believe. Yeah, r- right outside States. of Nashville, yeah. Okay. Um, would you say that that plays a big part in things that you write? Like, is Tennessee as much a character? I think, it, I think it does. I mean, I've, I've got some stuff that I've, I've worked on that's not in Tennessee, and mm-hmm. it doesn't feel as, it doesn't come as it easy. Feel, yes, um, yes. So I, I definitely think it does, and that was one of those things when I, I think, you know, when I started back in 2005, I think that was one of the things that was a problem. I didn't, it was almost like I was ashamed of where I was from, and then as I was learning, seeing all these other authors and discovering this, I was like, well, maybe I shouldn't be, I'm I'm a Southern boy. I was born and raised in Tennessee, so let me just accept that right. and go and, embrace and it. someone. I, yeah, mm-hmm. embraced it, and whenever I put that in there, it actually kind of worked for a change. So, and I think that's that's an important point to yeah. to make for writers that um, when they say write what you know, you're yeah, writing what's in your heart. Exactly. You know, you're writing you're writing what you feel, and, and it it rings truer. Right? Yes, absolutely, and it, it even felt it. I mean, it, the first draft of Consequences was done in a month. So that's. That's wonderful. I wish I could write that fast. Jeez, I'm yeah. impressed. That isn't that like, is impressive. That, I mean, think of all the people that we've had on our show. Right. Uh, how very few of them write that quickly. Exactly. Other than Jim Moore, who uh, right, <laughs> who, who who writes <laughs> who, who writes <laughs> mammoth titan novels yeah. uh, who write for breakfast novel in an right. afternoon, right? You know, that kind <laughs> of thing. But uh, no, that's that's amazing. That is I amazing. Am stunned by that. Well, and that was yeah. you know. Well, it, here's the funny thing, and I talked about this uh, on my website when I did it, and it, it felt weird because it's like, I don't want to brag, but I also don't know if this is unusual or not. So let me put it out there. Well, it turned out it was unusual. Yeah. <laughs> um, the first year, I started writing Consequences July of 2015. Okay. By July of 2016, I'd written 13 first drafts of complete novels. I was burning wow. one a month. Whoa. Wow, that and is like James like, Patterson level. Like if if James Patterson actually wrote all yeah, of his own right. novels, we won't get into that. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> now, no. not all of those have been great. I've gone back to try to because I took a break before coming here. Because I mean, writing that much that fast, obviously, right. I was I was rapidly approaching a creative burnout. And I'm like, yeah. I'm just starting. I can't do this now. But I went back to start doing some some edits and second drafts and stuff. And I'm like, wow, what exactly was I drinking when I sat down to write this? <laughs> but the stories are there. It's just a matter right. of cleaning them up. And I think that was, that's what I'd wanted to do. That's what I was apparently supposed to do. <laughs> apparently I've been bottled up for a long time. Yeah. And it's just <laughs> when I finally got that one out, it was like the, it was like pulling the cork and everything just sprayed out afterwards. And, hmm. That's great. So. Because then, you know, even if it's not something that you want to use now, you mm-hmm. know, when editors start saying, Hey, what else have you got? Send me your next one. Yeah. I can go back through, find exactly. what I've got that's, that's the cleanest mm-hmm. and, and most suitable so exactly that's wonderful now you mentioned as far as influences go i've noticed uh skip inspector oh and yeah and brian smith who else is it who else is an influence um, on, on your style let's say it's a hard question to answer i i used to have the easy answer for it and i've kind of learned that that influences are kind of weird for me mm-hmm. because it may not affect my writing style directly okay but it affects 
my writing habits and, and the things that I'm trying to establish being a writer. Like uh, uh, a prime example, uh, my newest influence. I read uh, Jonathan Jans's Witching Hour that he released, and he had okay. the little thing in the back about how it was written and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having a wife and kids myself, seeing how he is with his wife, and then listening to the panel this weekend, actually, that he was on about writing and relationships. Right, and, right. And that kind of stuff, I'm like, that is how I want to have my life balanced with my writing and with, because, you know, still got to have the day job and, and, exactly. and with, the, with my family and things like that. I'm like, that's what I aspire to. So I enjoy his writing, and that made me take notice, but it, his, his doesn't affect my writing style in so much as it affects gotcha. Your the approach overall to writing approach itself. to it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a hard thing for me to say on influences, because I'm, I'm, I, like I said, I started off, of course, Stephen King, Clive Barker, Dean Koontz, mm -hmm. working down into the splatterpunks, and, and then the the new generation, the leisure guys, you know, Brian and, and, right. and Brian Smith and... and uh, layman, I, I think it was reading them that made me realize I could write horror because before, okay. I think the first thing I tried to write, I was too conscious that I was writing for an audience. I wasn't telling the story I wanted to read. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And these guys showed me, hey, rip the doors open and go. Just don't sacrifice your story. See, that's interesting, because I feel like a lot of writers, it's the other way around. They write for themselves first without any real conscious thought about the audience. And then they, they develop, okay, well, this is great, but if I want to make it commercially successful, I have to kind of tweak this or mm -hmm. change this a little bit. But it's interesting that it was sort of the other way around. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're, it's, it's, well, it's like I mean, singing. It's like singing in the shower. Like. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so tell us about the short story collection, the, which is Three Shots and a Chaser. Three Shots and a Chaser. Um, the first thing I did after I published Consequences, and, and the smartest thing I did, um, I was put in touch with Erin Almahiri, and I hired her as my publicist. Okay, she's super sweet. She, oh, I love she's her. She's really cool. I was really hoping she was tentatively supposed to come this year. Yeah. I, I really want to meet her, because when we did our uh, podcast telethon, mm -hmm. of ours, she promoted the crap out of that online. Like, for oh, 24 yes. hours, she didn't oh, go to yeah. bed. And yeah. she kept posting on Twitter and Facebook. And I was just like, I want to hug you. <laughs> I know. Cause, she's cause incredibly she, giving. She, she, she is. So she nice. is. Every, yeah. every one of our emails now ends with a virtual hug. Because it's just, <laughs> right. no, she's great. Yeah, she's, I mean, and of course, I'm a self-published author. I've never done anything, didn't have anything in my name. I mean, consequences, I mean, you can tell by the cover, I didn't have any money when I put that together. <laughs> so... I like the cover, honestly. I, well, I like the sort of subtlety of it, you The know? digital part of it's nice, but when you... I didn't know how Create Space worked. I didn't realize that it gets darker when you print it. So that little yep. shack that shows up on the digital cover, not there at all, except for just a little pattern of the roof in the corner. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I didn't, see, I didn't see the shack. <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. <laughs> but and it also right, depends right. on the screen you're looking on. But exactly. That, that actually and I was proves, looking at it on yeah, my phone, so, yeah, yeah. And that actually proves the point. So I know better now. Um, and I, I emailed her with her a little bit, and she's like, yes, yeah, send it to me. She took it, and we kind of talking through that tour and stuff because mm -hmm. I actually apparently wasn't super demanding with her and, and asked a lot of questions be and was genuinely trying to learn. I mean, if right. you're going to do something, know what you're doing, know sure. what you need to know about it. And uh, I landed the, I sent into Sinister Grin. They opened for an open submission, which I haven't seen them do one since, mm -hmm. in November of 2015. Okay. And I had Journal of Jeremy Todd finished, and I was like, well, let me shoot that in. And Consequences comes out, and the publicity tour for it's kind of winding down. And I would actually landed the contract with Sinister by this point. I knew it was coming out, but it was going to be June of this year originally. Gotcha. And I was looking at it going, man, that's over a year between releases. I'm just getting out. Consequences had managed to to pull some some critical acclaim out and and was getting some positive reception. I was like, I don't want my name to drop off. What do I do? Uh, exactly. And also, unlike most writers, I struggle with short stories. Every idea I seem to come up with has a broader scope, and I can't narrow it down enough to tell it in a short. But I had a few laying around that didn't fit any normal genre, and they didn't fit any right. calls that were open or anything. 
And I started thinking, I was like, well, maybe I can do something with these. So I emailed Aaron and, and said, hey, what would you think about me putting out this little short story collection? And I kind of pitched the idea, the old Twilight Zone and the anthology stuff where you've got the wraparound story to connect all three those. stories together. Yeah, I and love those. And she's like, absolutely, put it together, get me mm -hmm. a good cover, and, and let's see where we can go with it. And it kind of grew from that. So you've got the, the three little weird... Twilight Zone esque stories, which are a complete switch because consequences is just bloody, you know. <laughs> I was going to say, based tear. on your influences, yeah. Yeah, and this one is more the very subtle creep right. factor as opposed to that. So I put it together and I, I, I kind of wrote out the the bridge story between it. Right. So right. The, the book, I mean, when you look at it, it's set up, you know, chapter, basically chapter one, first shot. Chapter two, second shot. Chapter three, third shot. And then nice. the chaser being the story the that wraps it. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. That's a great idea. I mean, and it's interesting because I've, I've talked to writers who said, you know what I really miss are those sort of linked together anthologies mm -hmm. or the linked together collections. So, um, and another thing to point out too is that it seems that you're, you're trying to broaden your scope in terms yeah. of writing. You're not just writing, say, splatterpunk type stuff or extreme right. horror or quiet horror. You're trying a little bit of everything. Is that how, I guess, the uh, inspiration comes to you that you want to try a little? I mean, is it one kind that you prefer over the other or is it Honestly, like a business I'm, kind of? And I, it, I worked up the guts to go to his table and tell him this. I actually had to thank Joe Lansdale because of, you know, Brian talks on the show all the time about Lost Level and, and Right. Write what you, basically the write what you want to write thing. And, right. you know, I love horror, but I also love fantasy. I also love science fiction. I also love mm -hmm. all this other stuff. And I hate the idea of going into this career and locking yourself to a genre almost. Right. I, I right. can't stand it. And that I think that was part of my intent behind going from consequences into three shots was to show I'm not going to be this one trick pony. I'm not going to write just this one thing. I right. have a range of things. Um, a prime example, Aaron has to edit for me right now, a uh, just a straight ahead ghost story. Okay. There's nothing bloody about it. It does have, it, it's more emotional horror in that one. In fact, even I did three drafts before I sent it to her. I get near the end section. I still make myself cry every time I get near the end section. And, there's nothing in consequences that's going to make you cry out of feeling an emotion right, for right. something. So <laughs> it's sort of deeper, you right, know, philosophical. Yeah, yeah. But and, and dealing with some things that maybe subconsciously they were fears that I carry, and that was just my way to deal with them. I've also got uh, uh, I'm working on getting a home for two of the survivors from consequences, so I don't want to give too, any spoilers. Right. Um, but they put together a, a private detective agency, and they're investigating supernatural cases. Okay. All set in Tennessee. Um, so you're spawning. Uh, so and I've already spawning. written. Yeah. You're, you're I, spawning. No. What is the word I'm looking for? Uh, spawning. Spawning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. It, the, you're, you're crossing into other genres. That's what I'm trying yeah, oh, to yeah, say. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got two books of uh, what's in my head, a fantasy trilogy written. Oh, great. So I, I'm, Leah, I, I don't want to lock myself in. I want to be in the position that's maybe not immediately, but at some point where I can just say, okay, I've finished this. This is a, it's a Western here and, and get it out there. And gotcha. it, I think part of that though is coming up with self-publishing and not being afraid of it because I look at it, if I can't find a, a press for it, I can just do it. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. You said you worked with Sinister Grin mm -hmm. and you self-published something. Um, what do you think are the, the benefits of each type of each type of publishing model for you personally or self-publishing has some, some obvious benefits. I mean, you, all the rights are yours, right? It also has the disadvantage in that all the costs are yours, you know, <laughs> exactly. every, everything with the cover and there is so much self-published stuff out there that to get anything noticed and, and sell anything, it, it, it's a struggle. Right. Um, you know, Consequences hasn't sold that great, but it's still sold more than I would have expected for, for a no-name author putting something out like this. And I, I credit that to the fact we did the publicity tour and it did get some good reception and things like that. Right. But 
um, like three shots, I, barely in double digits on what it sold because we didn't push it either. Right. So, right. Um, so yeah, there, there's there's the advantage and disadvantage there, but at the same time, like I said, you keep all the rights and you can pretty much do what you want to do. You you can put out whatever you want to put out, and you're not constrained by any marketing being right. crunched down on you. But there's also something to be said with working for a press who who's handling that back end for you. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people think, well, probably think this is a weird statement. I actually find it relaxing to format the book for print. Really? Um, I don't know why that became a Zen thing. And even now I finish a, a draft, send out to my beta readers. I'll send it out to them properly formatted for a six by nine book and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. But at, at least it keeps me fresh on how to do it. Um, but, you know, they, they handle all that. Uh, I know right. Tristan at Sinister, because of some of the unique things with Jeremy Todd and how it was being set up, told me he spent 70 hours working on the formatting for the print edition <laughs> to that book. And I'm like, dude, you're a rock star. Right. I'd have given up after like five or six. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <I> mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's insane. But so it's, it has been really great having a publisher that takes a lot of that off my back. So I just had to worry about the creative end. Right, and, right. So. And speaking of that, um, because you, you you know you'd mentioned that you didn't do a whole lot of publicity push mm -hmm. for for the new collection yet, mm -hmm. but um, one of the things that I find interesting from you know I hate to use the term generations because I feel like we're all kind of you know we vary in ages right. and whatnot. But one of the interesting things I'm finding with interviewing people like Stephen Kozanewski, right, um, and 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 some of the writers who have come into this when uh, the face of the marketing aspect of publishing is different. Oh, yeah. What do you find to be effective publicity techniques? <coughs> uh, it, there doesn't seem to be anything where there's a rhyme or reason. And, and that, I think that's what frustrates me about it. Um, you know, I listen to Armand and, and Chuck Buda with Mondo Method a lot because I'm the I'm at, I'm in the sponge phase. I mean, that's what I've been doing this right. weekend is just sponging all everything I can about this. And, uh, you know, I listen to the stuff they're talking about, and it's like an ad for Facebook works for one person. It doesn't for another. Well, I've totally seen that. I tried a Facebook ad. I'm like, right. we'll see what happens. Nothing. No response whatsoever to it. And I'm like, okay, well, that was a waste of 10 bucks. But that's, like, that's generally what I've heard. Yeah. People. Um, but at the same time, Armand has used it, and it works. Okay. So I'm like, okay, well, but, but what magic button did you flip to make it work? Because I missed that setting when I set the ad up. Um, the biggest thing, actually, I think the biggest thing I've seen that has worked is the most old-fashioned. It's word of mouth. It, it's, it's people talking about it and getting, getting it out there. Because like, I noticed every time I had a review hit and, and some reputable reviewers coming out there with it, I had a little boost. And then a little boost, and then a little boost. And that's all reviews are. It's just a, a form of word of mouth. It's just with a digital distribution method for it. So, And that's a good point, too, because I think a lot of uh, and other authors I've talked to over the weekend have, have said something similar, that one of the best things you can do for writers, if you're a reader or fan, is uh, write a review. It's not like oh, yeah. we're trying to garner, like, you know, pats on the back but it does make a difference um in terms of sales right because like oh, you yeah, said it gives it you a boost you know it gives you a sales boost it also gives you a visibility boost in order to uh, the algorithm that say something like amazon has where yeah. the, it puts oh, yeah. the title Abs yeah, in front of other people yeah. so yeah, so that's a good point yeah. it, it's um, a little cat video to make a smile every day <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly now what kind of projects would you like to tackle for like it, it, other than just novel writing short story is there any uh -huh. other kind of writing that you'd like to do or anything any kind of like dream project you have in your head that would be you know really cool to try or um I mean, not really. The, the writing, the short stories, and, and I've somebody's asked the question before. In, in I don't know if it's Twitter, or Facebook, or whatever. But somebody asked the question: Do you prefer novels or, or novellas or short stories? Or does it have words? Okay. That's, you know, I, I, I could care less if the story is good. I don't care how long it is, and as long as it tells the story in the space that you have for it. Um, there's a part of me that would kind of like to write 
a screenplay for something one day. Right. But at the same time, I've tried that, just, just playing around with it, and it, it that's not... No, my talents don't lie there. So. It's a very different skill set. It is. I mean, it, it's, it's short stories distilled even more, I think. I, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, because you're, you're actually taking it apart and saying, here's your dialogue block, here's your action block, here's your right. descriptive block. And it, it's, oh, yeah, it's a definitely a different beast. And even but, from short stories to, to novels, like you said you're more comfortable with a novel length because you have the room to I've got the room stretch. to develop. My big thing in... It obviously showed because it got pointed out in reviews for consequences. Is characters, these, you know, the the typical writer schizophrenia. They're alive in my head. Yes. And, yes. And I'm not so much telling them what they're going to do when I write it. I'm writing what they told me they're going to do. Right. And that's my thing. The novel gives me more space to develop those characters and turn them into real people with flaws and, right. and dreams and hopes and ambitions that are going to get mercilessly crushed in three <laughs> chapters. But, as one does. <laughs> right, as, as, as happens. But, uh, yeah, so I, I, I think that's probably where I'll, I'll, if I can achieve my, my goals that way, I will right. be perfectly content just to stay in that, that field. So Awesome. Now I, I know you. I know that you think of yourself as a new writer, and 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 you mentioned that yesterday. Mm. Um, despite the fact that you are just from things that we've talked about, um, you already have a good handle on things that it uh, takes a lot of writers years and years to figure <laughs> out, which is awesome. But um, I find that a lot of newer writers, like when they're, when they're listening to the podcast mm-hmm. or listening to panels. They like to feel like they're not the only ones that have done something stupid. If oh, you can, yeah. t- if you can talk about it comfortably, is there something that you wish you hadn't done? Uh, I believe I mentioned the cover for consequences. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's all variables, though. I mean, and and I've come to decide, come to realize, there's not really anything stupid. I mean, one of the things that I did when I went into this. And I think it's the difference. When I, I started trying to do it back in 2005, I had visions of bestseller list dancing in my head. You know, I had the, yeah. the I'm going to quit my job in, in a year and be able to live off this income <laughs> stuff. Well, I, this time around, I took a realistic approach. Right. You right. know, I, I figure my my definition of success at this now comes in, in stages. Um, and, but when I did Consequences, I hit the publish button, you know, and, and sat back and went, Oh my God! What the hell have I done? What did I just do? What have I done? Can I undo this now? And I got, I grabbed a bottle of scotch and I got fallen down, hammered, and I just <laughs> regretting, just ever. regret, and going, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done this. And of course, um, you know, I had some help getting it together, right? Uh, and and it had been sent out to some people, and I, I sit down and I look, and Facebook pops up, and Brian Smith had sent me a friend request, and. Suddenly, it was just on a dime because I even mentioned in the afterward to to consequences that he was a huge influence behind why it was Aww. why it got done. And then I get that friend request, and it was like the validation I needed in that moment. Right. So I was like, oh, okay, okay, maybe I am okay with this. So it's it's anything I've done that it, that might feel stupid. Right. I definitely feel like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but, but I wouldn't so much say I don't that, know that I feel that, like I've done anything stupid. That does yeah. never go away. <laughs> that feeling and that's like... what I've kind of learned this weekend, too, which, which has actually kind of made me feel a little bit better about that. You know, right. I've had a chance to talk to some great guys, and I'm like, okay, none of these guys really know what they're doing still, so no. this, that's okay. I can I can live with that. In I fact, I had a that. conversation with Tom Montleone last night because mm-hmm. someone had said the exact same thing. Like, I, I haven't sent stuff out because I don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. He said, none of us know what we're doing. I said, Tom, do you know what you're doing? Tom says, I hope I never do. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of keeps it fun, right? <laughs> it does. It does. Absolutely. All right, so for the listening audience out here who are now all going to clamor to buy all of your books because you're awesome, oh, thank you. uh, what do you – what are you working on now? What is okay. the, the new thing that they're going to be looking forward to? And where can they get the stuff that's already out? Um, the next thing that I'm going to have after Journal of Jeremy Todd mm-hmm. um, is <laughs> uh, it's a novel called Mudcat that okay. will be coming out through JEA Press. Okay. Um, I don't have a release date yet. Gotcha. Um, 
but I, I have signed the contract with them. It's just kind of waiting to hit that editorial stage. It is more proof I'm from the South. <laughs> it is written in the style of a B movie about, and it's a, a novel about a killer catfish. I kind of like that. Sold. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. no, no. I'm 100 percent in. I'm, I, I did. Yeah. That's, I hear that. That's, I'm like, that's I'm pretty awesome. It. I'm good. Yeah. That, yeah. It was like, I don't think I've ever heard that story before. No. No. Seriously. And that's, it was that's, that's a great idea. And I'm told they're mean too. Oh, I mean, I'm not. A, I don't fish, sure. but they, oh yeah. Yeah, there. if you catch one, mm-hmm. and and it's when you when you reach in to grab to get like the hook out or whatever, that thing will bite you mm-hmm. and it, hard enough to to leave bloody welts on Ooh. you. Oh yeah, Ooh. It, yeah. they're na- they're, they're nasty. aggressive. Yikes! Yeah. Well, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, that it, really does. It was actually a lot of fun to write it to. I wrote it as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s. I still play D and D every Wednesday night. And, hey, and that's my, all good. My group is over, and I'm sitting there. I, I was at that stage. I was like, you know, I, I want to write a creature feature, but I don't know what the creature should be. I have no idea what the creature needs to be. And one of my friends is like, dude, you're from the South. Make it a catfish. <laughs> and, of course, we all laugh. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's funny. I walk in the house, and my kids are watching something on TV, and I hear catfish can survive for up to 30 minutes out of water. Oh, that's like a the, nice coincidence. The yeah. universe is telling yeah. you something. And then, of course, it's four guys sitting around the table, and it's a little crude here, sorry, but we get in the conversation about the dick fish from the Amazon. That we're <laughs> right. In. And, of course, when you get in that stuff, it's like, all right, Wikipedia, what is this? Part what? of the catfish family. Of course it is. I want, that's it. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll do it. So. I'm curious. What is the dick fish? Oh, you've never heard of this? Yeah. I, I, I don't, I mean... <laughs> Maybe in New Jersey we we use the term dick fish for something else, but I'm not sure. What is the dick fish? Most of most of the stuff is just rumor. Um, but it, the Amazon, I think, was where they where they are. But guys would be in the water and they would urinate in the lake or whatever like that, and the fish would be drawn to the nutrients in the urine and would swim up the stream and into their. <gasps> yeah. That's all our story right there, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. that sounds painful and and and. Now awful. you see why that was the thing that clinched. Okay, I yeah. got to write this story. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my. And I I wrote it in the, the a complete. This is a B movie. I mean, there's there's one point in the prologue <laughs> where one of the characters acknowledges an audience cheering. So. <laughs> it, nice. It's, yeah. Nice. But that was it was it was a blast to write and and I had made contact with uh, Tony Inot was one of the people that okay. I made contact with when I first got into this. And I sent him a, a message and said, hey, would you guys be interested in this story? He goes, we just published a book called Shark Angela. What do you think? <laughs> All right, I will send it your way. <laughs> nice. <Yes. laughs> that sounds like fun. It really does. Now, you have a website where people can go and check um, out? It is johnquickfiction.com. Okay. Um, and it, it's blog posts and you can go in there and, and you can actually there are links to to go purchase all my books or you can just get them all through amazon either way great so great um i'm not sure if the sinister books anywhere else yet but i know they they sometimes they spread it around to other formats sometimes they don't so right and it's, sometimes it's i'm surprised when it shows up like oh hey I, I can get my book here too right yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm with you um do you have anything else you want to ask dave no it's uh <laughs> you had him at catfish, yeah, yeah, yeah. apparently. <laughs> right. I'm stuck on the whole catfish thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I do have a question for you because we've been asking people this question all weekend. Okay. Um, and this is like a new thing we're going to be doing. Uh, what is your favorite horror short story and why? Favorite horror short story and why? Man. And everybody responded the same way. Um, <laughs> hmm, yeah. Wow. <laughs> God, I really have to think about that one. Um, actually, it's going to be kind of a cheap answer. <laughs> but <laughs> my for novels, I have those that lock in, and they're they're my favorites, right. and they always are until maybe something comes along to supplant it. But uh, short stories are a little more fluid for me, right? Because I think. There's so many of them, and you tend to read them more. So my favorite at the moment is probably one of the last ones that I read slash heard. Okay. Uh, I attended Matt Hayward reading here. Right. And the short that he read out of his book, 
um, oh, I feel so bad, Matt, I can't remember the title, but it was about the vampires going to a, uh, a suicide mirror, basically. And nice. Considering that, that I thought vampire fiction has been done to death for right. so long and mm -hmm. kind of burnt on it, that was a neat new take on it. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. I actually kind of, I want to read more about that, that kind of thing. <laughs> so right now I'd say that's probably my favorite okay. short. Oh, nice, nice. We'll have to tell him. I think he'd be delighted. Uh, he listens to the show, so... Uh... Yeah, he'll hear that. I guess oh, so, oh, right. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. forgot that other people are out there and going and listening to this. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, we, sometimes. I, you know, it depends. It depends. Uh, some episodes, uh, <laughs> Dave and Phoebe episodes, uh, no one listens oh, to. Oh, <laughs> we love Dave and Phoebe. Yeah, well, that makes two people. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, I think we've taken up enough of your time. Thank you so much yes, for being on the show. Thank you this so much was, for having me. This was great. Yes. Yeah, it was fun. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, best of rerun John Quick's first appearance on the show. Uh, I want to remind you that if you enjoy this show, you might also enjoy Defender's Dialogue. That's a little podcast I have with Christopher Golden. Every week we talk about 1970s and 1980s Marvel comics you might also enjoy cosmic shenanigans that's a podcast mary does every week where she talks about cosmic horror beyond hp lovecraft dungeon master is literally leaning towards the microphone what do you have to say um cosmic shenanigans is very deep very deep yes you've you've heard a couple episodes of cosmic shenanigans you weren't quite sure what mary was talking about no i wasn't well, you, but that's okay you know what no. that's how i feel all the time She's very, very smart. So you might also enjoy Matt's podcast. That's Grindcast, uh, where he and his co-hosts talk about the latest in video gaming every week. And, of course, uh, as I said at the beginning of the show, you can watch Dave live stream most nights at twitch.tv slash Meteor Notes. Of course, uh, Defender's Dialogue, Cosmic Shenanigans, and The Horror Show with Brian Keene are made available by the Project entertainment network if you go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com you can pick up horror show with brian keen swag coffee mugs t-shirts bumper stickers pillows mouse pads iphone cases uh just an endless array of of stuff with our logo printed on it uh that helps out the network you can also help them out by supporting them on patreon just give them a dollar a month and you get access to episodes and things that you can't hear anywhere else in fact there is an episode of The Horror Show with Brian Keene that you can only get on the Project Entertainment Network's Patreon page. Um, so if you just can't get enough of me and Dave and Matt and Mary, and Dungeon Master, of course, you can go there, give them a buck a month, and you can get more. Um, if you want to advertise on The Horror Show, contact our boss, Armand Rosamilia, at the Project Entertainment Network. Uh, his email address is armandrosamilia at gmail.com. That's R-O-S-A-M-I-L-I-A, -I -I Armand. Um, and if there's something you want us to talk about, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or briankeen.com. The Horror Show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. We'll see you next week, folks. Say bye, Dungeon Master. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Three guys with beards. The usual gang of idiots. That's me, Christopher Golden. New York Times best-selling authors. My name is Jim Moore. Interviews with pop culture stars and creators. So I'm Jonathan Mayberry. And they don't talk about politics. Course of human events. Jesus, let's not talk about the course of human events today. I said they don't talk about politics. I suspect we may bend our rule about no politics on the beards and talk about politics on the beards. Didn't you say they don't talk about politics? If 